Yes. Your voice changed then, Jeff. Very good. <laughs> right, uh, I think uh, Anne, welcome. Okay. Um, I will share, share your screen. Are you seeing this? We are. <laughs> Not for the first time today. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Anne, I work for Securius. I'm a cybersecurity consultant and also a cyber essentials and cyber essentials plus assessor. So today I'm just briefly going to give a quick overview of what cyber essentials is for those that aren't familiar with it. And for the people that are familiar with it, we'll talk about what's new in the new question set, which has been called Beacon by IASME, which was released at the end of April. So the Cyber Essential Scheme provides you with an opportunity to prove that you have taken control of these five important areas in your organization across the devices. There's the secure configuration, your boundary firewalls, access control and admin privileges for your staff, is your patch management up to date and do you have malware protection? The benefits of having a certification include, um, it reassures your clients that you're taking your cybersecurity seriously. This can also enable you to tender for contracts that would previously be out of your reach. Um, you get free cyber liability insurance um, of up to 25,000 pounds and you get to be listed in the directory of organizations that have been awarded Cyber Essentials with the end of Cyber Essentials. So the difference between Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, for Cyber Essentials, it's a simple online questionnaire. Um, you go through an answer and then an assessor will check your responses and check to see if they meet with the cyber essential scheme requirements. Once you've, we'll feed back to you and if there are any, quite often, usually, um, there are tweaks that need to be made to, to some answers. Um, but once everything's fine, we um, re issue your certificate and your badge and your report. This needs to, this step needs to be taken before you can progress onto Cyber, Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, and then this is where we come in and do an audit. Um, this includes internal and external vulnerability scans, desktop audits and browsers and email accounts will be tested with malware test files. Um, we issue a report and, and your Cyber Essentials Plus badge and certificate and it's really a case of just validating that what you've said in level one is actually the case. So why has it changed? Well, as you all know, um, there's sole traders and there's massive organisations and the questions, it's very difficult to get them to fit all, all instances, if you like. Um, so we get asked questions, um, certain questions trip clients up frequently. Some we need to go back to IASME with and ask for clarification as well. They take all of these questions at the National Cybersecurity Centre and revise questions as they feel they need to be. It could be you know, just rewording or eliminating questions or adding questions. Um, some of the questions we get, um, a, a popular one in the last year has been, um, the, the original question was, do you have any home workers? Well, contractually, probably no, but legally we were told we had to work from home where possible. Um, so, and then the home workers are wondering, you know, do their home workers fall, um, home routers fall into scope? Do I need to list servers? Why do I need to list the make and model of my mobile device? It's running Android 10, it's supported. Um, what does configured actually mean? What do you mean I need to list all my applications? You know, all of these sorts of questions crop up. It's all fed back to IASME and the NCSE. And then we get the revised question sets, which they're looking at reissuing twice a year now. 
So we can expect this to be changing regularly. So what has changed? Uh, many questions have been reworded, um, as just touched on with the, um, the home workers. Um, it now makes it a, a little clearer what it doesn't mean necessarily that you're contracted to work from home, but if you are legally told that you have to work from home, it now clarifies that situation. Um, they're also recommending now that before you embark on answering the questions, you should read the Cyber Essentials Requirements for IT Infrastructure document. It's not a new document, but it will help eliminate some of the queries that you know you're going to hit as you go through the questionnaire. Um, this can be downloaded from the ncsc.gov website. And there is a question in the question set that asks you to confirm if you have read it. There are also a few additional questions, but I wouldn't have said that was such a bad thing. Um, so before the previous question set, this is what the scope of the assessment questions look like. And now it looks like that. Simply all they've done here is added the server devices question 2.6.1. That's because very, very often clients would enter their uh, desktops and their laptops and forget to add the servers or not realize they had to add the servers at that, in that question. So that's um, an additional question gone in there. Uh, the section that has changed the most is section six, which has ballooned up to that. Um, that's because of nightmare question A6.2, where um, clients were asked to list the software applications and their versions, um, which presented uh, quite a few heart, heart failure moments for, for a lot of uh, clients. So this has now been specified. Now you specifically just need to add, provide internet browsers, your malware protection and your email and office applications, which makes it a lot less tedious. Um, also the operating system and uh, so, uh, software application updates, security updates, um, drilling down into how do you ensure that your patches are installed within 14 days. Um, if it's, is it done automatically? If not, how do you ensure uh, categorically that these patches are installed within 14 days? Um, it's quite a biggie. So they've, um, they've drilled down into that. And that's really, that's the major changes. I mean, you I could waffle and send you all to sleep with the rewording and a few other things, but these are the major changes in this question set. But um, as I say, the question sets will be revised twice a year. So this will be an ongoing thing. So thank you very much for listening. And I will try and stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Your camera will come on then, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> you see my ear again. <laughs> That's it, yes. Well, thank you, Anne. That was very helpful. Just a, uh, just, just, just a like, right sort of update, really. I was... Uh, yeah. I looked at Cyber Essentials for a, a, a while ago. Um, I was I was getting curious as to what had changed, so that's uh, perfect and timely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Darren. Yes. Especially well, subject is ISO twenty seven thousand and one, and you have yeah, five I have. minutes in the microphone now. <laughs> five minutes would be quite a job. Let me try and uh, share here. I'll give you six if you need it, or four. Yep, lovely. Thanks, Darren. That's great. No problem. Okay, so I'm Darren, I'm the operations manager here at uh, Securius, and I'm also an ISO uh, lead implementer. Um, so this is basically what ISO 27001 is, and how to get it, the benefits, pitfalls um, that we see from other organisations. So um, it's quite a task to, to cram 27001 into a, a 10 minute talk, but uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly. So in a nutshell, it's uh, justified risk management for your information security. Um, and the reason I say justified is because the standard itself will give you a, a window or control, not a tick box exercise. Um, for instance, the technical controls, it won't say that you need to do vulnerability scanning every three months. Um, it will say that you need to consider um, the technical controls around, around your information. So you have to consider that um, asset, you have to consider your risk as risk is different for everybody. 
Effectively, it's a, a guide to establish, implement, maintain, and continually improve an information security management system. So it's a never ending process. You're always learning and you're always improving. It um, ensures that you're assessing and monitoring your risks and you're always planning before acting. Um, risks are always changing. And ISO ensures that you, you're monitoring this change for any outside influences or internal. Um, competitors, for instance, you'll have no control over. But this will affect your how you look at risk. Um, you can be the most secure company on the block, um, but if you're not competitive, you're not paying those bills. So your risk appetite and your risk review can change over time. Um, ISO 27001, it helps you put your controls in place. Now, these can be policies and procedures, which I like to call handshake agreements. So these are only as good as, as the first human error. Um, you know, I promise to do this is basically a, a policy and procedure. Um, and there's also the technical controls that you can put in place. So you've got that belt and braces, and it's always best to look at risk and the mitigation and controls with both the policy and procedures and the tech controls that you can put in place. Um, ISO 27001 is a, a holistic security. You have to look at everything all together as, as a whole picture. And many people fall down in the fact that they think that ISO 27001 is just information technology uh, and it's not at all. So an asset is anything of value. Uh, and this can be people assets. It can be um, you know, there's many guises to information security. It can be your business IP it needs to be protected. And it has you have to look across the, both the physical, the technical and strategic. All of these things have a um, have uh, an influence on how you run uh, risk reviews and your risk management. Um, and obviously, you need that resource, um, and you need to keep on top of your resource management and monitoring to make sure that you can effectively fulfil the information security management system. Um, we look at uh, risk opportunities, problems, and improvements um, in our risk register. So, risks and opportunities are things that um, haven't happened yet planning for them. So um, we always look at those things on the horizon that are coming towards us that could happen. And then there's always those things, the incidents, the problems and improvements that happen that we learn lessons from. So we've got the plans and we've got the lessons learned. All of that gets fed back into the same system so that we're continually in this cycle of improvement. Um, the last update to ISO really concentrated on, on the framework, the 10 clauses, uh, and this is so that um, other ISO standards such as um, quality 9000 and 14000, they can all be combined into one combined management system. So looking at why organizations want it, I've put the top three that we often come across now, um, and that's the bidding and supply chain demand. People are being told to get it or they know they need it in order to, to, to get contracts. Um, or um, the due diligence in the, in the supply chain demand. Um, the other reasons are that companies actually do want to put in, first and foremost, a, a robust and resilient um, security um, review for their, for their risks. And the, uh, the third one is a combination of the above. It's the board and telling the leadership that we need this for whatever reason. And it could be reassuring the stakeholders, which includes your staff and some of the other reasons. It's a world-recognized standard, so it's world-renowned. Um, it's a proactive risk management, and this is maybe the installing of a culture change and um, making security awareness, um, all your staff involved in that. Um, not wanting to be the weakest link in the chain, it's quite often um, built into that uh, due diligence. And uh, it's a foundation of good practices. So you can, you can implement the ISO 27001 now and as your company grows um, ISO and your policies procedures your, your information security management system that will expand with you um, and as I mentioned the combined management system some people already have an ISO and they just want to expand uh, and become better mostly it's a financial drive um, but once people start implementing or they have implemented their, their system um, uh, they understand the benefits they understand it's a tool to be used Morning, guys. So, how do you get it? Um, so, it's a one size fits all. Yes, so this I'm, I'm just trying to pose it. Uh, this has to fit a uh, husband and wife working in a shed making Christmas cards, all the way up to a global multi site corporation. So, this is why you have those justification windows. It, you have to look at your risk, uh, you have to look at your um, method of controls. 
you need to understand your system, and this is role specific. So your RTMS team, your core team, they need to have a really good understanding of how the system works. But everybody in, in the organization needs to have an understanding of where their role fits. Um, and this is vitally important to make the system work. So um, I would call it on the coalface. You need to have those incident reports. You need to know what's happening at the coalface in order to learn from that and in order to improve. If you don't have that information coming in, the system is simply not going to work. Um, you have mandatory documentation. And again, it's all based on risk. So looking at things like your, the impact and probability of risk to your assets, the worst case scenario, how much is it going to hurt and how often is it going to happen? Um, you need to know what is of value to you. So that's your asset list. And it may not be in your control. Electricity, for instance, you need that in order to provide a service or a product. What happens if it's not available? So it's a, a risk to be considered. Um, you need to prioritize those risks, and we do that through threat and vulnerability um, of an asset. So a threat is a, a burglar, a vulnerability is an open window, and you need both of those two things in order for there to be a risk. If there's uh, an open window and no burglar, there is no risk. Um, you prioritize those risks, you, people need to know what's expected of them, and then you need to gather that evidence that, um, that you need to monitor, measure, and improve upon. If you say you're doing it, then you need to prove it. And this uh, system of improvement is known as a Plan, Do, Check, Act. So it's a never ending cycle, Plan, Do, Check, Act, and you're establishing what you need to do and how you're going to do it through your policies and procedures. You don't do anything without planning because you might introduce a new risk. So you need to understand what you're going to do before you do it. Um, and it also must fit your everyday. It, it's your risk, it's your system of control, and, and it's your improvement at the end of the day, and that's different for everybody. Um, the do part of Plan Do Check Act is operating your RSMS, and that's the implementation of the plans, the evidence gathering the, of the forms and the records. And then once you have that, you need to check that it's working. And that's through auditing and management meetings, which is a catch-all. You need to make sure that it's fulfilling the standard and it's also um, outputting what you expect of your system. And from that, if nothing's actually working, you need to act on it. You need to fix those non-conformities. Uh, you need to give an owner to that treatment plan a deadline and you need to monitor that that, um, that plan is working and effective. So the process of certification, we would say that uh, the first thing you do is, is get in touch with an external body. Uh, and this is UCAS registered, um, we would say, because they assess the competence of that company that's going to audit you. And there's usually a three month lead time for that. So that's why it's important to get, um, get it moving quite early on. You implement and run your ISO. Um, you gather that um, evidence. You have to do a full internal audit. So that's an audit of your documentation, your controls, your processes, your procedures. And then you have that RSMS management meeting to review, act, uh, implement any plans of improvement. And then you have the external stage audits from the external body. And this is broken down into stage one and stage two. So stage one can be thought of as a document review and your understanding. Um, can you actually run your RSMS? Do you have everything available to you to run it? And then the stage two is that evidence gathering. Are you actually running it properly? Um, are you learning from your mistakes? Are you improving? Um, and again, saying in your policies, you're doing something, an auditor will ask to prove it. Benefits very much like uh, any other certification, but the main one being that it's, you're gonna reduce your risk, um, your considered risk, your justification of risk and your controls. Um, it's going to put a robust, robust security process risk management system in place. If you don't already have one, it's going to combine all of that into, into one place with one team uh, that's in control. Um, it's continuous improvement. It's raising that awareness. Um, it's in going to increase your reputation because it's a world renowned standard and you're going to win new business from that. You're also engaging your employees in your supply chain uh, into your security way of working. You're raising that awareness and improving uh, in that sense. And it's flexible and scalable because um, as your business grows, you have that foundation that's going to grow with you. So the pitfalls we see um, and where it goes wrong, the leadership buying, you need that authority to act. You need, uh, if it's important to the business, it's important to you. And we quite often see that if there's no leadership buying, it, it falls down because people aren't taking it seriously. Um, resources, another one uh, that we see as a bit of a failure, understanding of the roles and how the system works. Um, and levers of main key 
team players um, with no handover. We've seen ISOs fall apart and have to be completely re-implemented um, because there's not that knowledge of how it works um, and there's not the resource in place. Understanding it's not a paper exercise, this isn't a tick box exercise, it's different for everybody and, and you have to justify your reasons for doing things. Um, and the only way it's going to work is to get rid of that blame game. You, you, if the ISMS team don't know what's happening, you can't improve. You need those inputs from audits and the incident reports. And cost of gaining, some people have actually implemented an information security management system, um, but they haven't been certified because of the cost. And that's fine. And in the bidding process, it will often say certificate or proof. Um, and if you're running an ISMS system, you've got that proof. Um, so I've rattled through it, but in, in summary, ISO is really a tool to be used. It's used um, for the organisation um, via the plan do check act system. It's never ending system of improvement. Uh, auditors will expect this over time. They need to see that improvement um, and you should expect it from yourselves. Um, the justification of the controls of your risk change over time. Uh, in a nutshell, it's basically um, what is important to you? How do you plan to protect what's important to you? And if those plans aren't working, you need to fix it. Um, Darren, and that's that very was, quick. That was perfectly tremendous and most impressive, I have to say. It was a tall order to get through. Thank you. Thousand one in a short burst of time, but there were some uh, really nice high-level pieces. When I've sat through other presentations on this, you know, you're, you're, you're into the third hour and it's getting a little tedious. So, <laughs> certainly for my own appetite, that was absolutely perfect. And, and I think uh, ju just what the doctor ordered um, for this morning. So thank you. And uh, um, I'll, I think if, if it's okay with everybody, I'll sort of push questions to the back end. So scribble your questions down, and then we'll have a, a session with. Um, uh, when we were all completing the presentations. So thank you for that. Uh, welcome to uh, new joiners um, who joined during, the, during that first slot. Um, there's a few dropped in, Nick and Jerry. Uh, apologies if there are others. Um, so uh, um, next up, Andrew. Andrew's talking about Salute My Jobs and its new platform. Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you, Robin. Morning, everybody. Lovely to talk to you. Um, I'm Andrew Jackson, talking to you from somewhere near Poole this morning. Um, and Guy heading down to Paynton tomorrow to enjoy a bit of your sunshine um, and, of course, avoiding the G7. Um, uh, I run a little social enterprise called Salute My Job, um, which I set up about five years ago. Uh, I, am, uh, I did a full career in the armed forces. And uh, when I left, uh, or in fact, my last job in the army, I was responsible for recruiting, and that enabled me to have a much easier transition than I otherwise would have done. And I joined an American HR science and technology company called Conexa, which is quite a rocket ride. And like every company on a rocket ride is, discovers it gets swallowed by a whale. And in our case, that whale was, was IBM. And at that point, I joined the company that if you asked me to list when I joined the army aged 18 uh, to list the companies I would never join when I left the army IBM probably would have been at the top of the list so I am personally very driven and salute my job is built around the principle that there is actually a world of opportunity out there for military people if only a we had visibility of those opportunities b we could access them and c and most important of all we could uh, uh, understand what steps to take and take the right steps um, to get into those um, uh, roles where people can fulfill their true potential. And cybersecurity is a particular area of interest. Um, and we have been busy helping uh, ex military people transition from military security to cybersecurity and realize themselves that uh, there is uh, a world of opportunity there uh, for them. Uh, along the way, uh, I've watched with interest the uh, MOD's uh, desire uh, program to encourage employers to sign up to the Armed Forces Covenant. And I have been struck by uh, the gap uh, that seems to exist between employers and their opportunities and people in the military community. So if I just share my screen, uh, I'll give you a quick um, run around 
uh, and, and show you what we are doing, which I hope will be of interest to some of the companies here. And then I'll come back to the cyber point just at, at the end. Um, so around six and a half thousand companies, including I know several on this call, have signed the Armed Forces Covenant. And it strikes me as something which is um, also full of potential, uh, a lot of which is so far unrealized. So as a little contribution to this, uh, we're now hosting a, a directory, the UK's first directory of forces friendly organizations. The MUD publishes data in good old spreadsheet form, which I don't think any ex-military job seeker has ever actually accessed. Um, so we are capturing that data and um, uh, uh, which I shall show you now. Um, I know Durgan's not here, but if I use uh, SETSAT as an example, um, he's had to do uh, nothing here. We are capturing data from his own corporate website, uh, from the MOD's data around the pledges that that company has made, and in his case, whether um, the company has been awarded a gold, silver, or bronze award. And we would be delighted to work with any companies, whether you've signed the co co Armed Forces Covenant or not, who would like to be get listed. That is, uh, there's no charge to that. And uh, it's very encouraging to see how uh, enthusiastic employers are uh, to have their companies listed on there. And more importantly, to talk to members of the Armed Forces community about what they're doing. Um, and a good example of that is my new best friends at Tesco. Um, who have, uh, their guys have had the same problem I had in IBM, which is that uh, the owners of the corporate website, in Tesco's case, wish to talk about the latest grocery offerings and the anything to do with their armed forces program gets relegated to a corner of the website that um, a member of the armed forces community is unlikely to find. So they want to do, what they're doing is uh, bringing activity from across the company, Tesco Finance, Tesco uh, Phones, and the high street stores um, into one place. This is, it's work in progress, but it's coming along. And um, so uh, they've added in here um, some specific uh, about us, blurb for the armed forces community, uh, the commitments that the company has made, the fact that it's got a gold award, that's the same data we pulled through. More importantly, um, they have added, and they have paid a bit extra for this, they've added uh, case studies, because what they're trying, the message they're trying to get across is that um, there is more to um, Tesco's than stacking shelves. And this guy, Mike Hainsworth here, um, uh, has an interesting story uh, of how he got into uh, essentially their cyber team. And I'll pause talking about that platform because Mike is a good example of someone who uh, came on one of the courses that uh, Salute My Job uh, has run for the last five years in partnership with IBM. IBM have been great supporters of what we've been doing since the, the day I left or turned myself from being an employee into a partner. And um, we have run face-to-face uh, -face courses until COVID up at Corsham and around 500 or so people have gone through those and they're short courses to help uh, people understand what cybersecurity is, um, the types of roles that are open to them, uh, to help them realize that it's not as deep tech as many of them think. And as I said at the beginning, that those opportunities are, uh, 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 they can compete for good jobs uh, in the cybersecurity space. So uh, Mike did a short course uh, do, uh, being certified uh, as an analyst on IBM's Q Radar uh, SIEM product, uh, and having done that and a couple of other things, uh, he uh, landed this job at uh, Tesco. And we have got many case studies of um, people whose eyes have been opened to a whole new world. And for those of you who know that the military community, we like to follow well trodden paths. So lots of people do um, uh, train as health and safety uh, specialists, uh, project managers, they do their Prince II practitioner course and actually quite do do, uh, do ISO 27001 um, 
uh, accreditation jobs, those sorts of things. So um, there has been a real fight to persuade military people that cybersecurity and the language that it's all wrapped up in, they can penetrate that, they can understand it, and there are great jobs there, and, and Mike's a great example of that. So back to this uh, new platform, uh, they've got uh, the case studies in here, and then um, in Tesco's case, they wish to and have paid for, um, paid to share, uh, as you can see, uh, 300 of about seven or 800 jobs that uh, Tesco's um, wish to promote specifically to the armed forces community. And we are, uh, the platform captures those jobs directly from Tesco's careers site. But most importantly, we then filter those to um, try and get these to the most relevant uh, jobs that, um, uh, this, sorry, the jobs that are relevant to the armed forces community. That's not just former servicemen and women, but it's um, uh, spouses, dependents, uh, cadets, all sorts of things, anyone within that uh, community. So, um, and uh, Tesco's have got this work in progress. They're about to add content talking about the, the charities, the work they're doing on Armed Forces Day. Uh, which is coming up uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And um, uh, it, it's an opportunity to, for them to bring together and to promote what they're doing uh, to their armed forces community. And importantly, it's, um, uh, it's got a business benefit to them because I don't know about you, but uh, if I see a company that's doing something to support the community I'm passionate about, then I'll shop there instead of, uh, somewhere else. Um, very quickly, two other parts to this. Um, for the military job seeker, um, this is um, beta technology currently based on, on job boards, so it's not great. But this is what we're calling an opportunities marketplace. And the key piece here is not just to include jobs, but um, to include uh, other opportunities, training courses. Um, of course, I'm going down here and they're all jobs, of course. Um, but there are many um, uh, opportunities in uh, the marketplace around, um, for example, uh, the Open University have got a scholarship for disabled people, and they're very keen to promote that to, to people from the armed forces community. And those are listed in here as opportunities, and people can uh, obviously search those as they wish in the normal way. And the last and the impo and an important part of this um, is uh, what we call a saluting post, our blog and newsletter, because um, there is a real shortage of uh, trusted content in this space. And um, we don't write all of this. What we're trying to do is to capture this from all sorts of different places. Again, to help people realize that um, uh, indeed there is a world of opportunity out there um, and there are um, people there to help them realize it. And then lastly, uh, the training we offer is provided at no cost to the individual. Um, it's completely free, as it says here. Um, and um, we are uh, now moving, as you would expect, uh, towards a more online world. And we are using uh, IBM's Skills Build platform to help people uh, gain a basic, uh, well, actually not so much basic skills, so that Q radar the I2 analyst notebook, the courses that we've been running for some time are now visible on here. And some of those courses that we run are remotely delivered training, not just online training. And then very importantly, that platform allows people to collaborate with others to build their skills on project-based activity. For example, there's a great charity called Stop the Traffic, um, um, Modern Slavery uh, focused. And for people who've done a training course on um, I2 Analyst Notebook, they can then go and practice those skills working for that charity or helping that charity, which of course then gives them stuff that they can put in their CV. And um, this is um, all very much work in progress, quite a journey of discovery from us. Um, as uh, And um, I very much hope that we can engage with you to help you um, uh, find ex-military people if you're looking for them, or if you'd like to collaborate um, around um, cybersecurity and um, helping military people into it, building, particularly to build programs. Um, I'm, you're looking at this in terms of 
jobs on a job board, but actually it's the programs behind this that help people take those steps. That to me is so important. And I will stop and either answer questions now, Robin, or um, you can park me till the end. I will stay on um, and talk later. Lovely, thanks, Andrew. That was uh, that was great. Uh, a really nice and simplifying approach to what you know what we see. I think across the skills piece as a as a incredibly complex and, and disjointed and, and fragmented uh, landscape. You know that people have to try and navigate themselves. And it, it just struck me when you uh, when you showed me that before that that's a quite an elegant way of sort of, of trying to bring some of those moving parts together. Uh, I think we've got um, you know some some work to do in the cluster maybe to think about how we could engage with that you know up to and including you know the cluster actually uh, becoming part of the armed forces covenant which would be, would be good uh, but you know, put my business through it um you know, it propels you down a road of trying to help rather than it always being the nice thing you, you never quite get around to do <laughs> it took me three years to get to that point but it's great when you do it you know all of a sudden um you reference the um the open university disabled veterans scholarship uh, scheme um we, we, we're part of that you know we've got one guy who's studying his computer science course you know, interested in cyber you know we're just saying well you know what what can we do to help and it's, it's, it can be that easy so i think there's there's more to think about there andrew and, uh, and i think we'll we'll take that back into the steering group and um, and see what uh, uh, what we can uh, what we can do to engage uh, has anybody else got any questions for um, for andrew while while, while we're on the topic or yeah Andrew I'd, I'd certainly be interested in um maybe picking this up um uh, later on and, and sort of having a chat with you um do you do you do you, do you liaise with people like tech vets uh, like uh, are you yeah. yeah 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 very much part of tech vets I hate that discord platform but apart from that um <laughs> when I can pluck up the courage to use discord um and in fact you're reminding me that I need to do that um, they, uh, the only slide, I must go back to them, um, they're not wild about recruitment agencies, uh, which we're not, um, yeah. putting jobs on there, but certainly that sort of advice, that community piece is really important. Mm -hmm. And really to yours and Robin's point, this is about it being visible to people locally, but also within those communities, in that case, a tech community. Um, I think but collectively what we've got to do is to bring people from who don't think of themselves as technologists or joining a tech vets community, help them realize that actually then in this case, their military security skills are very transferable. And the same applies to other people who are changing way of life. So Dan, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you both. Super. Well, uh, uh, continuing the theme of skills, um, I'd like to ask uh, Mike to take his little 15 minute slot, if he could, to talk about the the, the, the exciting potential around the Cyber Futures programme. And then um, that'll leave five minutes till 10 o'clock for Sarah just to talk about um, her uh, piece on that, uh, which I think uh, will we'll pull all these strands neatly together for us. So, Mike, you have the mic. Mike. Thank you very much, Robin. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you see my presentation? We can, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Halliday. I've been working in education for about seven or eight years now, uh, primarily in university technical colleges. I also work for Lord Baker for the, uh, the Baker Deering Trust that supports the National UTC Network. Uh, I've been involved in cybersecurity education for about five years now, uh, having identified that there was, there was a clear connection between the increasing number of neurodiverse students that we were seeing in technical education um, and the clear trend of uh, neurodiverse people working in the cybersecurity industry uh, and attempting to find a way to link up neurodiverse students' careers uh, to something that would uh, serve UK PLC. Of course, I've built up a lot of experience uh, working uh, as an interface between industry and education, uh, particularly technical education. And um, what's clear to me is that th th there's, a, there's a very, 
is a very well recognized approach to trying to engage with every case education. Um, I get about 10 emails a day from various organizations, nonprofits um, that are trying to convince me to sign up to another digital portal so that students can self learn or watch a video or take part in a careers talk. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I'm on the wrong database, but this is what teachers see on a daily basis and they, they tend to delete these emails. Um, this, this is one part of, of what I see about how industry is trying to engage with education. Um, what tends to happen at these, this type of engagement is that uh, this happens to students. Students uh, are pushed into an assembly hall or a classroom and someone presses play or someone talks at them for half an hour or an hour. And cybersecurity is one very, very small slice of the number of industries trying to engage with education. Um, so we need to find a way of engaging with students in a different way. Um, this way, it, it must be profound. So actually what students are really looking for is a journey, not a series of very much ad hoc events that are making them aware of careers. They want someone to train them so they're ready for careers. And this approach also helps students to aspire to the careers that you want them to do. What has the most impact on a student, a profound impact, is that they feel they have a relationship with an employer or an, indeed an individual. Um, and this is very difficult to achieve because the two parties we have to link up are employers and teachers, uh, both of which have very, very limited bandwidth to actually put effort into making, uh, into designing the right form of engagement. Uh, they speak wholly different languages. Uh, and, and this for me is a really critical skills gap in how education deals with industry. Uh, so what I'd really like to do is uh, run through firstly, a, a case study of a program that we started delivering in September uh, during lockdown in Wales. And this is Cyber College Kimbry. It's running at two further education colleges. Uh, each college has linked this extracurricular program to a, a BTEC qualification that they're running in computing or IT, and it supports 20 plus students at each college. These numbers probably sound small in the, in the face of the huge skills gap we've got, um, but it's an alternative way for these companies to get engaged with education. What they were doing before was trying to deliver lots of talks to many, many, many schools and trying to get 20 minutes, half an hour bandwidth for kids' time. So, um, this is a snapshot of the program overview. I'm going to go into Mike, that in a little bit more detail. Yes. Mike, sorry, um, just to point out, I, I suspect your presentation is, is appearing on a second screen and you're showing the original screen because we're only seeing the original, the, the very first slide of your slide deck. Are you really? Okay. Okay, so let me share that. Can you see that one? Have I changed it now? That's slide two, yeah. Slide two, brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through the pilot program. Uh, this pilot is a collaboration between three industry partners that TechEd have supported. Uh, each of them uh, committed to collaborating and working together, uh, which is something that we haven't seen uh, in education. Uh, they all committed the resources that would be needed to, uh, to build and deliver a program. Uh, collectively, uh, we all identified and met with the colleges we wanted to work with. Uh, they've all shared the costs of the program delivery. Uh, and really importantly, they, they all committed to going on a CPD journey because the biggest skills gap from an educator's perspective is that industry find it very hard to engage effectively with young people in a way that resonates. So, in terms of what they've committed to in the program, this is an annual commitment. So uh, Admiral is delivering 10 workshops a year, Fujitsu executive briefings and projects within the BTEC curriculum, and TALIS 10 workshops a year. I'm gonna run through what that looks like in terms of a timeline over the course of a two year program. So the students, when they start at 16, um, undertake 10 workshops which are based on immersive labs uh, but the goal is that the employer provides the 
um, the contextual relevance of what is in that what is in that lab. Okay, so students aren't in a working environment. They're not seeing stuff happening on a desktop. They're not within a cyber team that's actually dealing with situations. And these labs can actually appear quite abstract if they don't have that context. Okay, so the first the first two terms are really about helping students to build a contextual awareness of how the skills within these labs are used within a cybersecurity team and within a, an organization. Um, the summer term then moves on to uh, covering some of the cyber essentials technologies. Okay, so the, the goal is that we have vendors that are presenting the technologies and the methodologies that uh, enable an organization to become cyber essentials certified, I hope is the right word. And at the end of the first year, we then moved on, move on to some of the advanced um, cyber security technologies that are covered at university. Okay. So our first cyber week is kicking off next week. We're running it at the University of South Wales and the lecturers are delivering three hours of workshops every day through the course of the week. In the second year, we start to get a little bit more serious. And what we really wanna do is alongside that great contextual awareness and those labs that the students have done, <clears throat> excuse me, is to build up the credibility of their CV so that they feel as though they're actually building the qualifications they need. So autumn and spring term cover. <clears throat> um, in Wales, we're delivering Microsoft Azure and then a mix of other shorter qualifications in the spring term. So in autumn, they're gonna do Azure Fundamentals. In the spring term, they're then moving on to some, some shorter qualifications. Before in the summer term of their second year, they make their final career choices. And we expect that all of them are going to progress into a cybersecurity career, either, in university, either going on to university to study the right degrees or to go straight into employment or apprenticeships. It will probably be apprenticeships in this career pathway, okay? But already we've completed two and a half terms. Every single student running these programs is committed to starting a cybersecurity career. We don't have any 50 percenters. Everyone already knows this is a career that they want to do, okay? Um, so we have to divvy up this, this time, these activities across partners, and this is quite a job, okay? Asking one partner to do all of this on their own has two drawbacks. The first of which is that it's a huge commitment. Um, the second of which is it doesn't provide a lot of diversity from a student's perspective. We actually want students to understand what cybersecurity looks like in different uh, environments, in different steps in the food chain, so that's why we've got a financial end user, a service provider, and um, we've also brought in uh, a number of vendors as well to add, some, to add some value to this. So this is what that job share looks like. Okay, so I've tried to color code it to, to make it easier, but um, the ideal scenario is where we have at least three partners. So if you look at the top, top right key, an end user, uh, a top tier provider and maybe a vendor and a university okay we might also benefit from bringing in uh, some smaller partners or those that aren't able to commit as much who might get involved in challenge days who might want to be able to offer careers advice sessions or who may be looking to recruit apprentices okay What's really important is all the partners have a very clear picture of how this progresses. So this is what we're hoping to deliver with the Southwest Cyber Cluster to identify a small number of key partners. Okay, Robin, I'm sure you're working on this in the background. Um, that can each share this responsibility and this commitment. Okay, what's really important is understanding how an organisation measures their ROI. OK, what I have learned and continue to learn is that there is no one single ROI justification. OK, the partners that I work with in Wales and in England all have various mixes of ROI. OK, 
actually, for those organizations that want an early careers pipeline, they may well be focused on a sustainable skills pipeline. So they want to know, are there 20 students that we know really well, we spent two years with them, we know their strengths, their weaknesses, we know their interests, but they know what they're good at, okay? They're not starting at 18, they've had two, they're two years in, okay? Another really, which fascinated me, a lot of organizations have social value conditions or clauses in contracts, okay? And very often, organizations are, uh, they budget the fine, okay? So most organizations, because this is difficult, they just accept this is a cost we're going to incur. We're gonna pay the fine because we're not meeting the social value clause, all right? This is not the purpose of that clause. The purpose is to make a contribution to society. And this is, this is where CSR sits. What's your corporate social responsibility policy, okay? This is a solution to help an organization achieve that, to raise your profile, to demonstrate that you are actually committed to helping society, okay? Right, the third one, bottom left. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible how much the industry professionals that we have supported, so by training them up, helping them understand how to deliver a workshop, how they feel, when they step back out and they say, yeah, that was a great workshop. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. You know, this makes your team feel good. Okay. But actually, if you're an organization and you want to be identified by future recruits as being a de facto organization they want to work for or a de facto technology that they know, they've been trained on it, you know, this is a way of making that impact at quite a level. You know, you're going to be you're going to be influencing and supporting 20 young people per year in a sustainable fashion in order to achieve those objectives. And last but not least is staff CPD. OK, so this is this is really limited to the the, the CPD for those industry professionals in understanding how do you deliver a workshop effectively to young people who are not paid to be at that workshop, right? That's quite different from people who, who might be on 50 grand a year who are sitting there and they've got to get this certification. You know, a teenager has, has a totally different perspective. If you're boring, they turn off in five minutes and that's it, right? We're in a situation where we need to embrace the next generation and understand how they tick because they tick totally differently than we did when we were teenagers. They engage with the world in a totally different way. And the only way that we can do that is to continuously learn. So the continuous feedback loop that we have implemented and we run after every single session, we get the feedback from the teachers, we feed that back to the employer or the individual professional and we help them to understand how to improve the subsequent session that they deliver. This is of the most tangible impact. We have seen the quality of every session go up exponentially from workshop one to workshop 10, okay? This is how we capture the minds, the hearts, the souls of these young people, and we get them skilled up, highly motivated to accelerate their training so that 18, they have a tangible value to the business community. So I'll leave it there. Hopefully I'm on time and I haven't gone over. I'll be very happy to, to field any questions um, on this call or offline. Uh, I, hope that's, I hope that's covered everything, Robin. Yeah, that's brilliant, Mike. Thank you. And, and, and for everybody on the call, what we've been working with Mike um, under the, the, the guidance uh, or, or sponsorship to some extent of uh, Patrick at the Cyber First Schools program is to is to see how the cluster can help facilitate this in the region. Um, uh, and that may or, or may not include seeing if we can secure the central funding from uh, DCMS looking at regional initiatives to see you know, whether we could put that in place uh, in conjunction and collaboration with uh, we spoke to Steve, uh, who thinks on the call at uh, Exeter College stroke at uh, the, the Southwest IOT. So, so we're, we're just exploring this because I think it just feels like the probably the missing bit of a, a fairly significant jigsaw to get 
uh, kids uh, involved and committed to a, a career in cyber. Uh, on on that note, I think uh, uh, it, this plays very much to uh, to Sarah's um, work at, uh, at at Cyber First within NCSC around uh, building the right ecosystem to achieve and accomplish a whole series of uh, uh, of objectives. So, Sarah, do you do you want to take your a quick five minutes to, to talk through what we're doing around the ecosystem Fab, uh, yeah. development and then um, just to, to, to assess people's appetite for maybe joining a short workshop to, to make sure we've got the coverage and the right connections in. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks ever so much. Just because it's being recorded, I'm just going to stay off camera. Um, sure. But but um, yeah, and, and thanks, Mike and Andrew and everybody. Um, really, really interesting to, to listen in. And I think there's a, a lot of ways that we can possibly collaborate moving forwards. Um, but yeah, as Robin is saying, I work for the Cyber First team with NCSC. And so um, for those of you unaware of Cyber First, we are trying to um, improve the skills and diversity gap within cybersecurity industry. And through that, we're trying to run a range of interventions for children and young people, starting from um, cadets through, he said, three, four, five, and university on, um, as Mike is saying, trying to build a journey of opportunities for young people to really understand the depth and breadth of opportunity within cybersecurity and very much trying to translate that in a way that young people can understand um, in a way that it, it resonates with them. So we have things like competitions. Um, we've run a pilot recently called Train the Teacher, where we're trying to upskill teachers um, so that they can go on and, and take that knowledge forwards. We work with ambassadors to run various events with schools, and we're also having strategic meetings with schools to really listen to what their needs are. Do they need more girls to take up computer science? Do they need to improve the diversity of their recruitment pipeline? And then building um, bespoke supports around that so then the new piece of work that's come into the team um, via DCMS is to build an ecosystem, a cybersecurity education ecosystem, which effectively is about how do we connect all the good work that's already happening that we've heard about today? How do we bring that together, raise awareness of the opportunities and really leverage connections between industry and education in a way that's meaningful and is going to have a, a real impact short term and long term to, to address the skills and diversity gap. So one of the things that the wonderful Robin has been supporting us with is um, helping us begin to identify how can we actually map an ecosystem. So we're starting with the wonderful Southwest. We will be going on to do Wales, Northern Ireland and the Northeast. But starting with the, the Southwest, what is the current health of the Southwest? What is the current cyber security activity that can be connected to education? And then based on that, moving forwards with a series of recommendations. So what do we need to address? What do we need to work more on? What would we recommend the government look at and fund in future? And then from that, we will then also be building the ecosystem. So working collaboratively with organizations, industry, education um, to increase awareness, to uh, build on these opportunities and, and really support the the drive to get more young people and diverse young people interested in cyber security. So what we're, we're seeking to do is just at the moment to reach out to as many people as we can, key players within the sphere, to really gain your understanding of the areas that you operate in, uh, your understanding of the needs, where are the gaps, you know, what, what do we need to focus on in the area um, and what is working really well. And, and from that, we can begin to map and build. We very much want this to be in collaboration. There's no point us just doing this on our own and not actually speaking to the experts and the people um, living all different experiences on the ground. And we are hoping to have a um, virtual workshop at this stage hopefully face to face in future but virtual workshop where we can introduce the ecosystem and the plans in more detail run it by you gain your insight your wisdom your ideas and then uh, begin to map and build that in collaboration with you so uh, it may be via robin that that something goes out in the future but we would love to to 
work with you, discuss with you um, how we could build an ecosystem, how that could impact you um, and very much um, bring you into this project. So that's uh, 10 o'clock. So I'm going to stop there, Robin, but thank you ever thank so you, much. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, so in discussing um, in this with Sarah and her and her extended team, a couple of bits become interesting. I think from a cyber cluster perspective, we've got such a diverse uh, uh, and probably single point of expertise across the region that it just struck me that a, a short a short workshop session with those that could spare probably an hour or so um, or an hour and a half uh, to engage with this initiative would probably be really a useful way to to help Sarah and her team sort of connect directly with those that have got um, a view you know I, I've clearly got a view and, 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 and shared it uh, with Sarah and her team but you know it's 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 the opportunity to just to cast that net further and wider to make sure we get a really good picture of the ecosystem. So I don't know how we feel about the best way of orchestrating that, but if Sarah pops her, maybe her contact details uh, into the chat, then mm -hmm. feel free to connect back to her directly or through me, and then we'll work to, to, you know, to put a, a workshop session together. Cause I think that would probably be the most effective way particularly if we can do it virtually that people could you know maybe allocate a bit of free time at the appropriate point and just make their contribution because um uh, i think it's uh, you know if we think about what the what the, the cluster is trying to do it's it's making the best out of the southwest uh, from a cyber security point of view so it, it's it's right on message so it's probably some the better ways jeff for us to <laughs> arrange and facilitate that we could certainly you know if we if we agreed on the scope of of the workshop we could push that out through our our um, our membership channel anyway but if people you know on the call would like to step forward and, and and volunteer some time then let's get that list together perhaps first and then we're um we're on that road what's your time scale sarah for for, for running the workshop so we'd like to do it um towards the the end of june uh, yep. possibly the beginning of july but we would like to get that conversation rolling sure. um within within the next few weeks obviously it would depend okay. on availability but yeah end of june or okay. beginning of july I've got a, um, a general question, if I can, just sort of broadly across the spectrum of, of cyber, um, uh, cyber security and education is that what I see generally is a huge amount of emphasis around the process and, and IT uh, side of security. In other words, you know, providing services or supporting, you know, organizations securing their systems. What I've seen less of, and I'm, I'm kind of intrigued as to what, uh, you know, as a company that's recently built a team to build a cyber secure product is does this does the kind of work that you know you're looking at Sarah or or Mike um, or any others on the on the um, in this area include the different type of cyber skills needed to build a product that's cyber secure and that's a different skill set to managing an IT infrastructure um, so I'm just intrigued as to you know particularly Sarah but also Mike you know how how you guys are looking at that aspect of cybersecurity? That's a really good question. Um, no, secure by design is uh, actually something that's, that's, that's very difficult to align to the current curriculum that's available. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is a real challenge because, you know, teachers fundamentally, they have a full time job, right? And their full time job has looked much worse this year than any other year they've ever experienced, right? But in a, in a normal year, their full-time job allows no time to identify how we might marry the existing curriculum that's available with something that is, that is not necessarily relevant to what they need to do to, to secure that, quali that core qualification, okay? And this is why all of the, all of the programs that I run are extracurricular because there's no way you're going to find a, a complete curriculum that, that maps to cybersecurity. These are not being funded by the DFE. They're being cancelled. Uh, the new qualifications coming out are very, very thin on cyber, the T-levels. Um, there is, of course, always an opportunity. But this, is, this, this has to be led by industry because uh, I'm sure Steve that's on the call would agree with me that we probably don't have many teachers in our profession 
that would understand where to start in terms of building an extracurricular secure by design program with the content required in, in order to lead students through that process. But we're, you know, I'm talking up to the age of 18. So there may well be within universities, uh, faculties that do have a focus on this. Um, I do have some ad hoc examples of organisations that have taken on small teams of students and taught them how to secure IoT devices and how to build prototypes with secure, secure by design. But that's not something that could be scaled up. These organisations tend to be fairly small, you know, rapid scale ups themselves. And they're not in a position to, to create a, you know, a programme that can support more than maybe five students. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously you have your universities that, that, that do cover this area if you're particularly interested in going down that channel once you get to that point. But my, my sense is there really is no, as you say, curricular content that relates back to leading to that pathway. Yeah, uh, Jeff, and uh, I think that you, you make a, a sort of, uh, it's a signpost to a really interesting point, which is a bit of my sort of soapbox which is so much of cyber uh, uh, education is focused in the technical domain as well and i thought you were going to say how do i build a business that's cyber secure which contains all of the professional uh, personnel um, legal uh, uh, peripheral requirements a able to 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 you know to pick off the people that are not technically minded uh, me because <laughs> a classic example you know I got a cyber career from being from a business perspective you know I understand elements of technology but you know when you start to think of the you know the legal ramifications of this from a from a from a law point of view or you know, clearly we've got the data protection and privacy issues um you know, personnel issues there's a whole range of uh, of things where cyber impacts that would be interesting to me to build you know to pick out those students that have got a, an interest in it from well we, as we saw with 27,001 that's a you know it's a business almost a business process engineering approach to uh, to cyber that is, is is not technical um so i think there's there is a, a, a it's a far wider a, a wider ranging problem um than the, than the one you you very particularly focused on which is you know that would shut the stable door once and for all if we got that right wouldn't we <laughs> exactly we are we are kind of training people to treat the symptom not the cause but um exactly. uh but yeah okay i look we've got a hum, whole bunch of hands up I didn't catch who went first so um Jeff, I can't see the hands. I can't. I, why can't I see the hands? Okay, so so Jeff, go on. Take it. Take away the Q and A. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Do you want to step in with your point? I uh, just wanted to say. I mean, uh, security by design is actually very hard to teach. Um, I mean, if we design a pure cybersecurity master's degree in the next year or so, it will be focused around that idea. But it is actually one of the topics that are more hard to teach than just checking or assessing security of systems because it requires a little bit more deeper understanding of a broader area. It's harder to get in the entry barriers a little bit higher than for other areas. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jeff, I've found the hands now. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> St Steve, you're, you're next on the list. Uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure whether I was next on the list, but just to uh, add and uh, corroborate with, with some points raised, uh, I think putting that kind of thing in, Jeff, it really is going to be down to the level. Uh, so that would be really tricky to do at the lower school levels. It's something we'd probably want to do at the higher level. But the, the, the big change that's happening in, in education, and it will take some time, is that we need to modularise. So we, we, we come from a world where everything's like two, three, four, five-year courses, to get things like, you know, designing businesses that will meet these needs, it's going to be about, well, we need a module for that. What can that be coupled with to come up with the right qualification uh, that can do that for everybody? So what we're doing at the moment, and we're seeing funding coming from DfE towards this, is to, to start to build these modules and see where they can take us. So if there is demand for a module about how you design, design securely, great, we, we can build a module for that and, and see how many people take that up. If there's a how do you run a cyber business uh, requirement? Well, again, that could be a module rather than trying to tr tackle it as a, a master's or a bachelor's or, or something of that size. So things, things are changing. Uh, what we all need to hear from you guys is the demand for that. So is, is it dozens of people a year? Is it hundreds of people a year? And, and we can feed that back and start to uh, change that direction. And maybe that will be a bit of the 
the outcome and consequence of the of the cyber first work you know what's the ecosystem what's that education ecosystem telling us around you know the appetite for a people to you know like us to get involved in informing that uh, a view from that ecosystem and then reaching back into it as that as their program extends to understand you know well what what is the scale of opportunity here um, because you know if you sit that alongside the regional digital strategy you know it is a real and genuine opportunity for the region to invest in you know uh, you know the or putting effort behind the words that say we want to be, as every other region does, the safest and most prosperous place to you know to do cyber business. Um, I'm best protected, and I've got a, a you know an opportunity, um, you know to, to to you know to to work and and earn as a consequence of that. Dan, do you? Um, yeah, I mean yeah. really quickly because I think um, I think Stephen Akin sort of yeah covered it off probably better than I, but I I think the main point just in regards to what you were saying, Jeff, is we've had um, the reverse feedback sometimes from the market, whereby if someone specializes too much at too early an age, they actually miss out on the raft of, um, I say basics, it's not basic for me, but um, basics in terms of the fundamental principles, methodologies that, that stack behind it and that broader um, knowledge base. So, you know, don't get me wrong, there's always the kid that can hack the Xbox at age seven, but you know, there is to specialize at a really early age can be good for, for lots, but I can see the resistance because if, if you do go down that route, you, you lose you know, the ability to be, maybe, know the, maybe know the broader principles behind infrastructure apps, et cetera. That's yeah. just what we've heard from, from clients. Yeah, and I don't think I was advocating that. Um, in, in actual fact, if you actually want somebody who can help you build a secure by design system, for example, um, and also a private by design one and confidential by design, which is a different thing, um, fundamentally trustworthy, which is another layer. Um, once you, um, they, these are all principle based things. They're, they are not specializations. They're an understanding of how to apply technology to building products, and that, that's not a specialization. What, I, what, I, what I'm just highlighting is the difference that I tend to see around these initiatives that are focused around the demand, as Steve put it, where it's very obvious there's a whole bunch of companies out there. They're really struggling to manage their IT infrastructure, and the demand is, very simply put, give me another guy who knows how to run my, you know, uh, install and properly set up a firewall, and, a, a, you know, it's like... Yeah, fine, but you're just treating the symptoms, guys, right? If we if we approached how we built our systems in the first place correctly, and and if we understood those core underlying principles better, we wouldn't be building the kinds of systems that need virus checkers. Right? Exactly, you'd eliminate it at source. There's a little bit that Jeff, uh, you know, and I think that that baseline understanding uh, is more around, you know, and I've been in a business where we where we where we fought the dreaded risk question because the risk consultancy was a separate thing. We got products that think very specific person but purposes, but of course, all this is only management of risk. And I was just as you were talking, and Andrew will recognise this. Yeah, the military have a wonderful baseline view of 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 of, of their world, which is um, you know, it, it's all about survival which is you know it, 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 the best way of surviving is if you don't need to be there don't be there and if you are there don't get spotted and if you are spotted don't get hit and if you get hit you survive <laughs> uh, and that you know if, if you could just put that in the head of kids when they're thinking about well what cyber about you know he just abstracts it to a level which is you know is what mike's you know, I, I think course was trying to you know trying to get to which is you know thinking about you know a there's practical expertise but you're wrapping an industry view of those practical skills as to well so what you know it's the why question asked six times you get to the essence of why you're doing something so i think what we you know what we've got the opportunity to do is is actually you know, take those individual individual disciplines that appeal to the individual aspirations and characteristics of people, but give them a, a, a contextualized view across the piece of what, what what that actually means. And I think if you know if these combination of things could achieve that through our engagement, you know, old and wise industry, academia, um, educators. Uh, then uh, you know we we would if we if we pulled twenty students through with that level of appreciation um, and understanding, then they could navigate their way into a, a really you know a forward leaning career. You know, 
um, which I think would be uh, would be really exciting if we set that as our, our goal and objective. Yeah. And Andrew, did I get that right? <laughs> I think I think it did. I think we've got another another hand up with Guy. Ah, Guy, oh, yes. yes. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, there's some really good and interesting comments here, and I guess I come from a uh, one of those difficult or problematic areas, which is position, navigation, and timing. When you know we we know about some of the threats to um, uh, and some of the vulnerabilities to, for example, uh, satellite-based uh, PNT signals, GPS, for example. And of course, what we find is that a lot of people in our industry specialize in GNSS or position navigation in timing, inertial systems, but they don't get that, um, get that cyber training. So in, in other words, what happens is we find that um, our specialists have to then talk to separate cyber security professionals who are not necessarily familiar with the GNSS side of things. And it, it adds to that, that complexity. So when we want to have secure by, by design and make things more secure, which I think is, is going to be crucial with geospatial data as more and more of our transportation systems become autonomous. There's a real need to, to try and get some cyber basics or cyber training into the PNT community, which I think is lacking today. Yeah, I was I, I, I dropped on a UK space agency um, session a couple of three months ago, and uh, and it was their approach to you know cyber security, and I was just sort of amazed at. Um, how basic it was i thought it was going to be something quite advanced <laughs> you know to, to you know to you know the, the cyber risks imposed on um, on space assets and uh, it wasn't it was just uh, it was effectively a, you know a, a, it was a, 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 a conflation of you know cyber essentials iso and a lot of the other standards and it went on and on and on and on and i, and I was i was quite amazed in actual fact um because you know they they're almost felt like they were starting from ground zero yeah, that, that, that's my feeling oh, sorry, too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I agree, Guy. Yeah. Mark, you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> really listening to the conversation, very interesting conversation. And it always takes me back it's to the, the, the points that have been made. Um, uh, uh, generally, about, I guess, with software, like they say that software is the, the 21st century, you know, cement and, and concrete of, you know, it builds our. It underbuilds our, our 21st century policy and we need to bring in that attitude that um you you know it's got to be best best practices of good by design and i've always thought whether the security cyber security community should be pushing you know lobbying and things like this through just to, to sort of get some sort of equivalent of like the the euro end cap that we all have for cars. We all know that a Euro NCAT 5 is a nice, safe car that you feel if you've got your, as a family member, you'd be happy to put your, you know, your, your kids in that car. And I, I wonder whether there's, there's a drive that we've got to come through from, from forums like this, where we need to be lobbying governments to sit there and say, look, you, you've got to be pushing in to sit there and say some kind of five-star award or, or and perception out of, of that to, um, to the community so that people can make the right decision and if people are then uh, leveraging their money about those right decisions companies will naturally have to uh, have to move it i mean i think at the moment if if i don't know how many of you ever read through like the 50 pages of the end user um e the e this eula it's amazing what what you are what you are giving away and I, I wonder whether, again, with this is whether there's a push to, to make software fulfill like a limited liability. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, maybe Andrew, I don't know what your, your history in the army is about this, but there's, um, there's a really big interest in thing about maps, how maps uh, uh, sort of 100 years ago changed from an artistic endeavor to a product so that you actually, uh, lim they actually came with a limited liability. So if you flew your aircraft into a mountain based on a map that had had a fault in it, you could sue that map producer because they had to take responsibility of it. And I wonder whether with automation and things like that, and cybersecurity, we need to follow down that route and we need to be pushing governments and we need to be pushing, uh, you, you know, um, the likes of the European Space Agency or any of these sort of government funded bodies to say, 
well, this is what you need to be doing. This is what you need to be doing. You need to be going to the companies that are driving forward with this technology, this technology and meeting this higher standard rather than maybe always going for, um, you know, value for money, which might be the cheapest. Mm -hmm. I don't know what. Well the, well, the trusted software initiative that we've been tracking yeah. for a long time, and you know they, they just don't get traction. You know, it's this the secure by design thing is coming through, but it's moving very slowly. I think it has great uh, grand ambitions and appetites, but you know it's always the case that you know um, stable whore and horse have bolted. You know, the whole cyber industry is a function of the fact that it was, you know, what are we doing? We're patching up poorly designed approaches, principles, products, implementations that we just got wrong at the outset. There was a, there was a Gartner conference that I attended where the Gartner lead for, uh, for OT, operational technologies, said, we've got a window. This was about six years ago, I think it was, five, six years ago. There was a window of opportunity to get the IoT security model right. And he said, you know, IT security will pale into significance if you don't get IoT security right. And I'm, 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 and I'm not actually convinced they've actually got it right because, you know, you look at the Secured by Design initiative, they've got a, I think it's a simulation of a chip. They haven't got the chip, yeah. you know, for the, the first Innovate UK guys on the first cohort for, you know, for Secured by Design funding to, you know, to play with. So, you know, the world is, is, is massively behind. Um, uh, and, and I recall at the Secure Southwest event four years ago, I think, when uh, Ian Bryant presented the, the, the Trusted Software Initiative um, uh, approach, I asked him the question about how many organisations is he seeing that are adopting uh, those uh, approaches as a competitive advantage, as some organizations, as, as Darren alluded to, you know, take 27,001 as a competitive advantage. And he said, none, it just doesn't, hasn't even hit the radar. Nobody's thinking about, you know, I can build a better, safer product. Therefore I've got an advantage at a software level. Just, it just wasn't there. Uh, that was four or five years ago. And I'm not certain um, uh, that it's moved on much further. Jeff, you've got some. Yeah, so just to put there. things into context a little bit for Mark, um, so the automotive industry you kind of referred to, and it, it is a very interesting and good example. I, I worked in that sector. I, I supplied software and technology into some of the first um, uh, power, um, engine management systems that were built. And that is a sector that I execute software development through a, a process called um, uh, Safe by Design, effectively. Well, that's probably the best way of calling it. But yeah, they're very, the way they build their software is at least 100x minimum the cost of building an IT piece of software. And, and 100x is probably very conservative, just to put it into context. And what you end up doing, because every line of code is literally checked over multiple times, you end up with basically decide, you know, at the requirements end, cutting out every single, single function you can down to the point where you can actually build something that doesn't cost, you know, push the cost of your car up by 50 grand. Um, so I'm just putting that into context because over the last, and, I, and a couple of years ago, I was working for a company that was providing some of the infrastructural technology to the next generation of cars, which are now running very complex software systems with radar, image processing, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And achieving that same security standard for that software is proving to be nigh on impossible. Um, they've actually degraded those security standards. So just be aware that if you want the, the clevers, you want the functionality, then, you know, cost effectiveness means, you know, you just, you, you degrade your security, you degrade your safety. And it's, uh, um, and it's always that balancing act in cars that kill people. If you don't do it right, you know, the, the standards are held high in markets where you, people aren't going to die. The standards tend to drop quite quickly. And that's, and we have an internet where, you know, the coveted, oh, it's free. Um, is, is a, as a sort of point of perspective or per perception of the user is the driving factor, which uh, unsurprisingly leads to software development processes that are fundamentally insecure by design, frankly. And, and achieving that balance is really, really challenging. It's the old two out of three thing, isn't it? You know, you, you're generally on the three points of a triangle, you can you, you put three uh, metrics and, and and the choice is always two out of three so performance safety and cost well which do you want <laughs> do you want uh, performance and safety well you can't have lowest cost if you're at lowest cost which are you going to trade performance or safety so it's it's, it's it's that you know that constant 
Is yeah, but I think it's a I mean, my view is, is you, you, I'm sorry, I, all I see is uh, SWCS. I can't, I can't, sorry, I can't remember yeah. your name, admin. <laughs> yes. No, you're, yeah. you're completely right. And the consumer is always making that balance between uh, cost benefit. But, and the consumer is very driven by price. You know, we, we are inherently bad. At, you know, we want, want to keep as much money in our pocket as possible. But do you not see that the um, the government funded organisations? Like, I guess the military is a fine example of that, where, where they have a sort of well, maybe unfair to say money is no object, but the, but they can spend a bit more that you can that you can drive good behaviour into the commercial sector. Which then naturally flows down. I mean, my example, my it's a very old example, but I was like, um, the example I've read about before is that what Basil Jet would did with the building of the the sewer system that they did at the end of the 1800s, where he had to put huge amounts of requirements to get uh, cement in. So he basically set up a system of making sure that they met the standards, and then those companies would win those contracts. But because they were forced to put those standards in, it naturally just seeped out to everything they do because, you know, they, you, they, if you're mass producing something, you don't mass produce best quality for these people and mass produce, and then the rest of it is just crap for everybody else, excuse my friend. But you kind of drive in good practice in through your whole supply chain. Yeah, and that supply chain initiative is the thing that, yeah, you know, I, think I mean, I've really always just... sort of lobbied the European Space Agency, I think they, they don't put enough emphasis because that's the industry I work in, in the space industry. I don't think they put enough en- emphasis on secure by design in, in their products that they develop for um, sp- spacecraft operations. Yeah. I mean, clearly, if large companies start to ask for more security and security by design, that has a lot of impact and ripples upstream and downstream through the supply chain. I've seen that when working for a large uh, software vendor, when we started to increase our security processes and then requested our suppliers um, to adhere to the same standards. Uh, And then suddenly also from our customers, requests came in. And if you start to enter markets that are more restricted, uh, you need to increase your quality and default security of your systems. And that helps a lot, but um, in particular for the SMEs, there is still quite a way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Just to sort of end on a positive element, by the way, things are, are progressing in that way, in that direction, Mark, in, in, in many ways. And I, you know, if, you, if you're into systems and software development um, uh, futures and, and what's coming down the pipe, I would suggest looking at something called capabilities, um, which is a uh, technological approach that's being architected into the next generation of processor design. Mm. and these future generation of processors, in fact, some of them do exist now, but they're kind of early stage, will in effect um, eliminate the, the mistakes that software developers make that allow vulnerabilities, that allow those hacks and, and you know, undermining security. And they estimate at the moment that it will probably remove something like 60%, 60% of all of the world's computer vulnerabilities. Yeah. So there's stuff coming down and, and that technology will probably be in deployment in about you know, uh, five years time at, at scale. But um, you know, there, there's, there's some good stuff coming, but it, you know, the only thing I can say is it is a war because as fast as you Arms get- race. To yeah. control, it's, you know, the hackers get smarter about opening the door. And, and the next big one to watch is the AI cyber attack because they're coming. Well, I, you know, I don't feel it's uh, it's uh, promoting because uh, I haven't been there for five years. But do look at the work of Deep Secure because they took that probe. They, they've taken the approach. It's there now. You know, this transformation of content. You don't worry about AV or your security, uh, your traditional secu- signature-based security infrastructure. You you take the, your data in, you transform it, you eliminate the threats, you reconstitute it, and you pass it into into your system. And, and that's you know they're, they're doing that line speed with hardware verification at the moment we got an update with them um, a couple of months ago and uh, yeah that's just you know you, you're just saying is it there has to be a different approach because everybody's got it wrong uh, and uh, you know the bad guy is the arms race you know you're constantly you know signature based stuff you're constantly leapfrogging and leapfrogging uh, each other um, so you just do something different 
uh, and you have to tolerate there's a trade-off in business as, as, as to what applications you can uh, you can use what connections you can make but at some stage you've got to realize if you want to be protected there's always that three points of the triangle <laughs> you've got to make a trade so you know like, be encouraged that yeah as Jeff says there, there is stuff happening I might well I might well ask I know they're not in our region but a really interesting bit uh, I could ask Simon to come along and chat to us at some stage technical level um, because uh, that's what they're they, you know that's what they've set out to do um, I'm just conscious of everybody's time we, we hit half 10 uh, the only ask really um, uh, I was going to talk, just talk a little bit about what the UK uh, uh, cyber uh, cluster collaboration there's three C's in it I can't ever remember which sequence uh, are doing um, I might invite uh, Rich from there to come and present to us either next session or, or the one after uh, because that's you know, we, we're part of that they're starting to they've, they've dropped the funding at a top line that we can then start to draw down on to accelerate our own uh, our own initiatives uh, one of which will you know I think has the potential to be in that skills space that we've heard about this morning so I think I'll ask um, Rich, the chair of UK uh, C3, to come along and, and just brief us on that, because uh, it is aligned with what we're doing generally. Um, the only ask, really, if there's people, if there's any of you that would like to, you know, to, to volunteer a bit of time for for Sarah's workshop, I think that would be a, 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 a great use of time. It would be really uh, constructive and um, uh, uh, and beneficial uh, for all. Um, uh, I'm not proposing it's a long winded affair. It's just uh, seeing what we can cut to the chase on. So if there's any of you particularly that want to, to, you know, to volunteer now, then uh, just drop me an email, let me know. Jeff, the only thing I was going to say is we ought to offer it out to the membership, maybe through an email blast. Um, if, if we can accomplish that quickly, then um, that might be the answer with a, with a reach back to Sarah um, to say, yeah, okay, these are the interested folk and then she can, uh, pull together the uh, the workshop session yeah yeah great uh, um, just get her to contact me with i think she's going to follow up with me anyway on the question that i asked at the yes uh, fine so okay yeah so I'll, I'll follow through on that yeah brilliant okay fabulous well thank you all um was there any other questions or points as we as we close off thanks to all the speakers today Thanks for the contribution to everybody. And, uh, and, and as I say, anybody that wants to come along and talk about a, a particular piece or have a 15 minute rant, feel free to drop me a note and say, yeah, we'd like to do this, Robin. And I just speak, I'll add you to the list. <laughs> Great, thanks stuff. Lot, Great stuff. So, well, thanks everybody. Uh, enjoy the uh, weekend of football ahead and the sunshine, hopefully. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in, uh, in July, if not. Robin. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.